2 uh, Samuel chapter number 7. I've entitled the message, The King Teaches Us How to Pray. The King Teaches Us How to Pray. This is David's response to God's covenant promise. David's response to God's covenant promise. Let's look at it together. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse number 18. This is the word of the Lord. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake, according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. Therefore you are great, O Lord God. There is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land, before your people, whom you redeemed. For yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. For you have made your people, Israel, your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said So let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true. And you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now therefore let it please you to bless the house of your servant. That it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it. And with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. We mentioned in our last sermon that 2 Samuel chapter 7 is one of the most pivotal passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 7 shows us God's covenant promise with David, what we have come to know as the Davidic covenant. And this covenant is crucial because there are several foundational covenants that are explicit throughout the Scriptures, each building upon the other. And together, these covenants form the storyline of God's redemptive purposes in Christ Jesus. And the Davidic covenant, again, is a crucial link to the fulfillment of God's promise to give us a Savior, to specifically give us Jesus Now, to bring you up to where we're at in verse 18, you're going to have to go back and listen or watch the message from two weeks ago as we looked at verses 1 through 17. But let me at least give you a brief recap to where we are at verse 18. When we opened up the chapter, we found that David was struggling, and he was struggling big time because God had brought a change of pace into his life. David was used to running and hiding and fighting. And now God says, I don't want you to do any of that. I want you to sit still. I want you to be patient. I I want you to rest. And so the Lord has given David a season of rest. But David's problem is he couldn't receive that. He couldn't accept that gracious gift from God. He couldn't, as it is the case with many of us, learn to sit still. He felt like he had to do something, which was a great 
weakness on his part. We look throughout the life of David and we find that downtime was not good time for David. And so he's adjusting to this change of pace. And as he comes up with this idea to, to do something, he actually develops a big idea. And the big idea is, I'm going to build a house for God. And it was with good motives. Because David was dwelling in this royal palace, this house of cedar built for a king, and it dawned on him that it was not right that he live in this nice, fancy, magnificent house when right down the way the ark of God was dwelling in a measly old tent. Of course, maybe to our surprise, God shuts his idea down. David says, I want to build you a house. God says, no. No. David, you're not going to build me a house. Rather, I'm going to build you a house. That's what God says to him. David, you're not going to build me a house. No, no, no. I'm going to build you a house. And we noted here that the word house was used differently than the way David used it. And David was thinking in terms of a physical structure, but the way that God uses the word is the word dynasty. Dynasty. No, David, you're not going to build me a physical structure. No, I'm going to build you a dynasty, a dynasty. And a summary of that covenant that God makes with David can be found in verse 16 there. You have your Bibles open. Look at it there in verse 16. This is what God says to David. He says, and your house your dynasty, your, your kingdom, it will be established forever before you. Your throne will be established forever. David, I'm going to build you a house. I am going to build you a dynasty, a dynasty that will never come to an end. That brings us to where we are tonight in the second half of the chapter. And the second half of the chapter is David's response to God's covenant promise to build a dynasty through his kingship. And what we have here is a prayer. It's a prayer that King David prayed. It's a prayer full of wisdom, much wisdom. And it gives to us, much like the Lord's Prayer that we find in the New Testament, a, a model for strengthening and deepening our, our own time in prayer. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at the context of David's prayer along with some very practical implications that we can take home with us in order to grow our own discipline of biblical prayer and faithful prayer. The outline that has most helped me is these four phrases that I've written down going through these verses together. And here's the first one. We find, number one, David, sitting in God's presence. Sitting in God's presence. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, then, then, all right? God has come to David through the vision that was given to the prophet Nathan. Nathan says, no, you're not going to build God a house. God is going to build you a dynasty. He makes this covenant with David. And then after he gives this word to David, verse 18, then, then, after the word had been received, then King David went in and sat before the Lord. I want to begin by emphasizing the word then. Then, that is, David's choice to go before the Lord in prayer was in response to what he had heard from God. He had heard from God, and then he went in to speak to God. This is what prayer is, church family. Prayer is simply responding to God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is responding to God. David listened to God's word and then he responds to God's word in prayer. In prayer. Now, it's very important that we understand that for prayer to be truly prayer and for prayer to be effective, it cannot be disconnected 
from God's word. With David's example, I want to help you. Consider this from a very practical standpoint, that when you and I pray, we ought to always pray with an open Bible. That's the point of emphasis here. We cannot disconnect prayer from God's Word. Therefore, when we pray, we ought to pray with an open Bible. Praying with an open Bible is what helps us to ensure that our prayers are heard. For the Bible, God's Word shows us exactly how to pray. It shows us what we are to pray for. In fact, we are in a much better position to know what to say to God if we are clear about what he has said to us. <laughs> and David's already got this wrong at the beginning of the chapter. He didn't pray when he said, I'm going to build a house for God. He wasn't praying. Nathan wasn't praying. These plans and ideas were of his own volition. But now we see his prayer is truly prayer, and it will be effective, and it will honor God because his prayer is in response to what God has said. When we pray, we need to pray with an open Bible. For there is no sense asking God for things that he has not already clearly spoken about in his word. So David went in. Verse 18 tells us, he went in presumably to the tent where the ark of God was being kept. You see, what God had just said to him moved him to purposefully go sit before the Lord. We gave you the imagery last week of how he's sitting late at night on the balcony of his palace and he's out there with Nathan and they're, they're sipping on decaf coffee, right? Right? They're bored because God has given them a season of rest. God didn't want them to do anything. He didn't want them to engage in more ministry. He didn't want them to build another house. He wanted them to rest, but David couldn't stand it. He just had to do something. And, of course, we know the rest of the story. Now, now God's word to David has moved him from his palace to the place where God's presence was. And it was purposeful. He purposefully went in to where the presence of God was. You see, effective, faithful prayer is always purposeful. It's always purposeful. He purposefully goes into the tent and sits before the presence of God. Think about the verbiage here. He sits there. That's why we should never be dogmatic at any point about what kind of posture we should have in prayer. Because throughout the Bible, sometimes we see people kneeling. Sometimes we see them standing and praying. Uh, sometimes people are running and praying. Here we see David sitting and praying. He purposefully goes in to the tent where the presence of God is and he stops what he's doing. That's the emphasis here. The idea, the picture of him sitting, it means he stopped what he was doing. He took time, church. He took time to sit before the Lord. And as he's sitting there quietly, he's, he's thinking. He's, he's meditating on what God's word had just said to him. He's praying. He's, he's pouring out his heart to God. And the first thing we recognize about his prayer is that his words are flowing from a humble heart that is thankful to God. Look at it in verse 18. He says to God in this moment of quietness where he purposefully goes into the presence of God, where he stops what he's doing, he makes time to sit down and however long he was quiet, that's how it was until he spoke up and said, Who am I, God? <laughs> Who am I, God? And, and what is the significance of, of my house, my family, my lineage, that you have done all of these things for me, that you have 
in the, in the exact words here, that you have brought me this far. We see at the beginning of verse 18 and continuing through the prayers the fact that David had just been told no by God. Think about that humility for a moment. He had just been told no. God has closed the door on something that David wanted. Have you ever been there? Of course. God has said no. Perhaps God has said nothing. Sometimes you're not sure if he's going to open the door or close it. Sometimes you feel it closed right there in the front of your face. Now think about David for just a moment. His big idea shot down. God denied it. God told him no. This is not what I want you to do. Instead, I'm going to do something for you. Yet there's not one hint of bitterness Study the prayer. But there's not one hint of anger or disappointment on David's part. Although his idea was denied by God, he still humbly views the Lord's plans and purposes as something that he is undeserving of. God, who am I that you would, you would do this for me? Who am I looking over my life that you even brought me to this point? How is it that you respond when God tells you no? A lot of us respond the way that our children do when we tell them no. Daddy... Can I have a piece of candy? No, not now. Dad, will you buy me that? No, not now. Two hours later, what's wrong with you? Nothing. <laughs> yes, there is. You're, you're mad. You're pouting. Can, can I help you tonight as we learn from David? When God shuts the door in your face... When God denies what you want, it, when God tells you to know, just go sit before His presence. Just go sit down, make time, get quiet, go to prayer and remind yourself and affirm to God that you are so thankful for all that He has done in your life regardless of not giving you what you wanted. That's what he's doing. Who am I, God, that you would even bring me this far? You see, sitting in prayer before God's presence, it must flow from a humble heart that first and foremost recognizes all that we are and all that we have is found in God alone. Prayer is a way that we express our thankfulness to him, and that is exactly what David is doing. You see it there again in verse 18? Who am I and what is my family that you have brought me this far, that you've done all this for us? We have a tendency to take credit for all the good things, don't we? While blaming God for all the bad things. But I think what David is showing us here is that prayer is the antidote to pride. It is also the antidote to self-pity. We must humbly go before God, sit still in his presence, and thank him for bringing us this far. So we find David sitting in God's presence. Secondly, we find him seeing God's purposes. Seeing God's purposes. In verse 19, David acknowledges God's perspective on things. And it's a good reminder that it's only as we hear the Word of God that we can actually see things from God's perspective, right? Because David's perspective is, I'm going to do this for God. I'm going to build this house for God. And God speaks His Word, and He says, no, David, you're not. Your son's going to do that, but you're not going to do it. In fact, here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to do something for you. This is my purpose for you. This is my perspective on your life. 
So that's what David does. He, he acknowledges God's perspective on things. And after acknowledging God's perspective, he says in verse 20, well, what more can I say? Look at it there. What more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, you know your servant. The word know speaks more than just God's omniscience, that God knows all these facts and information about David. It actually speaks of God's purposes, God's foreknowledge. David was saying, what can I say? You've established your sovereign purposes for me. You chose me. You took me out of the sheepfold. You're the one that's setting the course for my life. You're the one who's sovereignly planning and purposing all of these things. What in the world should I be giving you my plans for? <laughs> it's not about my purposes, God. It's about your purposes for me. And then he proceeds to tell us how God has actually done this. Verse 21, he said, for your word's sake, very important phrase there, for your word's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all these things, these great things, to make even your servant know them. What is David reminding us of? He's reminding us of the fact that God acts on the basis of his word and on the basis of his heart. God acts on the basis of his word, on the basis of his heart. It's not my purposes that need to be fulfilled. No, David says, God, it is your purposes for me. Your purposes that are based upon your word, that are based upon your heart. Remember when God chose David all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 13? So many people have gotten this verse out of context, misapplied it, misconstrued it, misunderstood it. We talked about it then, and I'm going to spend a long time on it now, but it's worth repeating here. That back in 1 Samuel 13, 14, when the Bible says the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord commanded him to be the commander over his people. The man after his own heart. We've heard so many sermons about being a man after God's own heart. Listen, that's wrong. This choice was not about the condition of David's heart. It was about the will of God's heart. David chose, or God chose David not because David was mystically special or that David was super godly or that David was this or David was that. No, God chose David because God's heart wanted David. It wasn't about David. It was about God. He chose him not on the basis of his worthiness, but according to God's heart and will to do so. Ever sat around and wondered why God chose you? Why God chose me? Well, listen, if you come ask me that question, I can't answer that for you. All I can tell you is that it was God's heart to do so. It was God's heart to put you where he has put you. It is God's heart to save your soul. It was God's will to do these things for you. And David is seeing that purpose. And that's what he's saying in verse 21 when we come to it. He said, look, this life is not about me doing what I want. It's about me seeing and knowing what you want. It's about your purposes for me. So David says in this prayer that he will focus on God's word. He's going to focus on God's heart. For it is by knowing God's word and heart that God will reveal to him his purposes. And again, church family, listen. This is why we cannot separate prayer from God's word. It's why we should always pray with our Bibles open. Because prayer is about seeing and knowing God's purposes. It's not about accomplishing my purposes. It's about seeing and knowing God's purposes. And to know God's heart is to know God's word. And to know God's word is to know how to pray. So he's sitting in God's presence. He's seeing God's purposes and not his own. And then he just burst out into singing God's praises. Singing God's praises. That's verses 22 through 24. 
So again, what what is the king teaching us about prayer? He's teaching us that prayer is not about getting what we want. It's about purposeful time in God's presence, responding to God's word. It's about seeing God's purposes rather than attempting to accomplish our purposes. And then it's about singing God's praises. David is choosing to sing of the greatness of God. And I can't help but to recall to my mind once again that David was just rejected. (laughs) Now, a a brother told me tonight about a a job opportunity. Man, it's easy to whistle and sing when the job opportunities come, but what happens when we lose them? It's great when everybody's obeying and sitting in line, but when it's chaos. David's just been rejected. His ideas shut down, but he's not pouting. He's praising. He's not pouting. He's praising. What a great challenge to my own heart. And quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I want to get to this last one, but just notice the things that he praises God for. He, he, in verse 22, he praises God's character. This is a great formula for how to praise God, how to hallow his name in prayer. Focus on his character, verse 22. He says, therefore, you are great, O Lord God. All of this that you are doing in my life, it's not about my greatness, David says. It's about your greatness. And lest anyone begin to think for a single moment that what we are seeing happening around our lives is because of any good in us, may we then find our humble place in the closet, sit before God's face in prayer, And say out loud, this is not because of my greatness, Lord. This is because of your greatness. Your greatness. He praises God's character. He praises God's supremacy in verse 22. He says, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you. It's similar to what David said in Psalm 23, isn't it? The Lord is my shepherd. I don't want anybody else. There is none like God. There is no God like him. He he praises God's character. He praises God's supremacy. He then, in verse 22, praises God's word. According to all that we have heard with our ears. Once again, David returns to the sufficiency of Scripture. We know the Lord and his greatness because of the gift of his word to us. And then he praises God's redemptive purposes. Look at verse 23, and who is like your people? Look at where David is putting the emphasis. He's the king. He's the king. He, he's the man in charge. He didn't say my people. No, they're your people. Who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people to make for himself a name? Notice that. He says, why did you save Israel for your name, not for ours? For your name and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds. For your land before your people whom you redeemed. Yourself. Verse 24, for for you have made your people Israel, your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. It's a wonderful reminder that our salvation is always about the glory of God. It's not about us. This was the one key emphasis of the Protestant Reformation, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, and for the glory of God alone. God's salvation in our lives is not just about us. It is about His name, His glory, we being His people, and today the proliferation of His Church, he redeemed us for his name and to make us his people forever. And so David just burst out into singing praises to God for how he has redeemed his people. David would later say in Psalm 104, 33, think about this. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God as long as I have my being. This is prayer. He's teaching us how to pray. And if your prayer doesn't involve singing praises to God, then there is a malfunction in your prayer life. 
prayer is singing. Singing is prayer. And David shows us that. He's sitting in God's presence. He's seeing God's purposes. He's singing God's praises. And then finally tonight, we see him standing on God's promises. Standing on God's promises. Verse 25, he prays, Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken. Again, there it is, the word of God. We cannot separate prayer from the word. You have spoken concerning your servant, concerning his house. Therefore, establish it forever. And notice this phrase, this is the mark of what we're to look at tonight. David says, do as you have said. That final little phrase there, do as you have said, is a theological summary of what prayer is. Prayer is not asking God to do what we say. It's asking God to do what He said. That's prayer. Camillo and I were having this discussion a couple weeks ago about God's sovereignty and His purposes and His providence. And if He's going to do whatever He wants anyway, then why do we pray? Well, that's our answer. We pray because we're not trying to get God on our agenda. We pray because God is trying to get us on His agenda. Prayer is not about getting God to do what we want. Prayer is about asking God to do what He has said He would do. David is teaching us a very important part of prayer. To pray the prayer of faith is to take God's promises and then turn it into prayer. Take God's promises and turn it into prayer. And once again, always pray with an open Bible because prayer is how the promises of God's word are delivered to us. It's saying, Lord, I have heard what you have said. I have read what you have said. I need in my life what you have said. Please do what you have And then in verse 26, he says, Let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel. Let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, has revealed this to your servant, saying, This is what you've promised. This is what you've said. I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. David says, I found it in my heart. That is, he found the courage to pray to God to make him a dynasty because that is exactly what God had revealed in his word to David that he would do. So do you follow it? That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians that all that we have in Christ is yes and amen. Amen. That if God has promised us eternal life in Christ, then we have it. If God has promised us peace in Christ, then we have it. If God has promised us forgiveness of all of our sins, then in Christ we have it. And it's on that promise we pray and ask God to forgive us because we know that we have it. And we ask God to come again because He said He would. We ask God to send His gospel around the world because He promised That all nations and every tribe and every kindred and every tongue would be represented in heaven. You see, it changes our prayer when we take God's promises and turn it into prayer. I'm not so sure that you'll find a promise ever in the scripture that says God will give you a boat. This is where I struggle preaching this sermon. But I would like to have a boat that actually works for once. There's a lot of things that we pray for that there's no promise in God's word that he will do it. You see, David had the courage to pray this bold prayer, make me a dynasty. Because God promised that that's exactly what he would do. You see, courageous praying is not according to the level of our faith. It's according to the level of God's promises. And I read this tonight, and I'm thinking I'm closing. David's prayer is very much like the Lord's prayer, isn't it? 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that is exactly how David ends the prayer. Look at verse 28. And now, O Lord God, you are God. And your words are true. You have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord, have spoken it. And with your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. In other words, Lord, please fulfill your word. Please fulfill your word. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You see, David's prayer was found standing on the promises of God. We used to sing that hymn when I was a kid. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. See, there's some other old people in this room tonight. <laughs> this is what he's doing. His prayer is standing on the promises. And that's what he teaches us. Church, when we pray, we are compelled to ask God to do what he said. Not because it's a good idea, but because it's what he promised. So can I challenge you tonight to slow down and go and sit before the presence of the Lord? Not with your phone on, but your Bible open. And see the purposes of God in every area of your life, not necessarily what you want done. And while you're in there, sitting quietly in the presence of God, just just sing a little bit to him. Sing about his character. and Sing about his redemption in your life. Sing about the glory of his word. And then take God's promises and make his promises your prayer list. Ask him to do what he said he would do. I'm afraid that we have butchered what prayer actually is. And perhaps the king shows us tonight to change course. Oh, may God help us to pray more fervently with deepened faith and strength in God's promises to take care of his children. Let's stand together for prayer.